sometimes when I read studies, I just think, dang, that would have been so cool to research. And I spent years of my life researching ice cream for my PhD. That's pretty cool, right? But I have to share with you some of the results published by a research group in France that is looking at what is the best way to drink champagne according to science. When you think about champagne, what do you like about this type of wine? And if I had to guess, most of you would say you like the bubbles, you like that it's sparkling or bubbly. And to understand how those bubbles got in there in the first place, let's do a quick champagne 101. Now, when we're making champagne, we add the yeast and also some extra sugar to the grape juice. What the yeast do is they actually eat the sugars in the juice and they produce two different things. They produce alcohol, more specifically ethanol, but they also produce carbon dioxide. And it's this carbon dioxide that is turned into those bubbles. Those tiny bubbles are bubbles of carbon dioxide. Now, when the bottle is corked, when you have an unopened champagne bottle, actually the carbon dioxide, it's dissolved in the liquid. So it's not in the bubble form yet. The only reason the carbon dioxide turns into bubbles is once you open that bottle of champagne, you have released the pressure. In fact, you hear this pressure release, that's the pop. You release the pressure and this allows the liquid carbon dioxide to convert to the gas state, to convert into these carbon dioxide bubbles that we love so much. With that little primer on champagne, I think we're ready to talk about what that research group in France did because really the goal of actually several of their papers was trying to find, is there a way to keep more of those bubbles in a glass of champagne? Or if you want to say that very scientifically, you can say, well, you're looking at the loss of dissolved carbon dioxide in the champagne, which is the title of this paper. Now, the first thing the study looked at is, is there a right way to pour a bottle of champagne into your glasses? And they looked at two different methods. I think there's probably really only two main ways of pouring champagne. And the first is you just have your glass, it's standing straight up on the table, and you pour that champagne from the bottle directly smack dab down the center of that glass and it hits the bottom and you pour a glass of champagne. The second method they looked at was more of like how you would pour a beer. What I mean is you take your champagne glass and you tilt it on an angle so that as the champagne is being poured into that glass, it hits the side of the glass and then flows down to the bottom of that champagne glass. And the study found if you want to keep more of the bubbles, more of that carbon dioxide in your glass of champagne, you really have to be careful how you pour your bottle of champagne. And the biggest difference here is that method one, where the glass is just standing straight up, as you're pouring that champagne down, it's actually very harsh on the champagne. It's a uh, very turbulent. There's a lot of turbulent flow, and this allows a lot of those carbon dioxide bubbles to escape prematurely. Whereas if you treat the wine in a bit more gentle of a way, if you tilt that glass and then you pour in the champagne so that it flows down a bit more softly to the bottom of that glass. This is actually much better at retaining that carbon dioxide, which means you get to experience more of the bubbles as you're drinking your champagne. And the scientists even estimate that by using this more beer-like way of pouring champagne, the more gentle method, you preserve up to tens of thousands of bubbles in your champagne glass. And you can visually see this huge difference uh, at this picture. So the scientists use infrared thermography. It's kind of like a heat map for how much carbon dioxide gas is being, is leaving each glass of champagne. And you can see just how much bigger a cloud is escaping that glass that is poured under that turbulent, that harsh condition. So if you want to keep more bubbles in your glass of champagne, treat it with some respect when you're pouring it. And the next variable the same study looked at was temperature, meaning they wanted to see if the temperature the champagne was served at 
if that impacted the amount of bubbles seen in the final glass of champagne. So the study cooled champagne down to 18 degrees Celsius, 12 degrees Celsius, or 4 degrees Celsius. And your refrigerator, just for comparison's sake, your fridge is probably around 4 degrees Celsius. Now, what the scientists found when they measured how much carbon dioxide is still in a glass of champagne after it's poured, they saw that the more you cool down a bottle of champagne, the lower the temperature, the more carbon dioxide stayed in that glass of champagne. So for example, the samples that were only cooled to 18 degrees Celsius, these lost a lot of that carbon dioxide right away, where the lowest temperature, that four degrees Celsius, these retained much more of that carbon dioxide, so they retained more carbon dioxide and in turn would have had more bubbles. And if you look at the delta C here, that is the loss of carbon dioxide, you can see at that lowest temperature, four degrees C, you have the lowest amount of loss, only uh, three grams per liter, where if you go to that highest temperature, that 18 degrees C, you're up to four grams per liter. So the more you cool down that champagne, actually the more bubbles and carbon dioxide that are retained in your glass. Now, why would this be? Well, it all comes down to how fast a molecule of carbon dioxide can move or diffuse, which means it wants to move from the concentrated area of carbon dioxide within the champagne to the air where there is a lower concentration of carbon dioxide. Now, what we know about diffusion or a diffusion coefficient is it's very temperature dependent. And you can see here, D, the diffusion coefficient, the higher T the temperature goes, the larger the diffusion coefficient is, or the easier it is for those molecules to move around and escape your glass of champagne. So what this means is, well, of course, the lower the temperature is, that smaller value of T will result in a smaller diffusion coefficient, and it's harder for those carbon dioxide molecules to leave the champagne. And you can also see here that diffusion changes with the viscosity of the champagne. So eta, that's viscosity. And also by cooling the champagne, we do slightly change its viscosity probably. We can't perceive it. But in theory, the lower the temperature of champagne, it will have a slight increase in viscosity. And if you take this change into account, as well as the change in temperature, so at high viscosities, diffusion coefficients are slower, they're lower in number, and this also could explain why those carbon dioxide molecules are just not escaping as quickly at that four degrees Celsius versus those higher temperatures. And just a quick reminder here, if you're enjoying this video, please hit that thumbs up button and please subscribe to my channel. Let's move on to a second paper published by the same research group because as you may have guessed from my props, we need to talk about which is the right glass to serve champagne in. Is it the flute or the coupe? So these are definitely the two most common glasses for champagne to be served in. But like the study talks about, this is very odd because these glasses are entirely different, right? The flute is really tall and skinny and has a very small opening, whereas the coupe has like all this surface area of the champagne, it's very wide brimmed. So the study wanted to test which one of these glasses is better at keeping the champagne bubbly. As you might expect, they found some pretty interesting results and I want to show you that heat map of the carbon dioxide leaving the glasses again. You can just visually see the coupe, oh it makes it so easy for those bubbles to escape into the air. And that's because it has such a wide opening. There's just more surface area of the champagne meeting the air. It's easy for that carbon dioxide to escape. Whereas the flute, it has just that narrow opening. It's actually quite easy for the flute to retain those carbon dioxide bubbles. It's much harder for the carbon dioxide to find its way out. And this actually has more implications because actually the aroma or where we get the flavor from champagne, 
These are also volatile molecules. So volatile just means they're molecules that escape from the champagne into the air. And once those aroma molecules are in the air, they can go into our nose and we smell the aroma or the bouquet. Now, if we use something like the coupe, where these molecules can escape quite freely and quite quickly, we may actually lose a lot of that aroma before you ever enjoy it. So using something like the champagne flute helps retain not only those bubbles, but also the aroma molecules until you have it right up into your nose and you can appreciate all the essence of the champagne. I will say there is one caveat here where if you're someone who thinks uh, champagne, like all that carbonation has a bit of a bite, it hurts your mouth, you actually may opt for the coupe because it releases more of that carbon dioxide. It wouldn't irritate your mouth as much. So if you know anyone that complains about sparkling beverages hurting their mouth, they should actually opt for the coupe to let some of that carbon dioxide be released before they drink it. Oh, and if you're someone who wants, you know, not too few bubbles, but not too many bubbles, there's actually a Goldilocks option, I just have to grab it. So the study points out that if you want like a middle ground, a middle level of carbonation, you could actually choose something like a tulip shaped glass because obviously this opening is bigger than the flute, but smaller than the coupe. So this would lead to a medium level of carbonation if you so choose. If that's what you really, really want, go for something like a tulip shaped glass. And here's one bonus fun fact I just have to share with you because the research group took the most beautiful pictures. Now, have you ever wondered why with like a glass of a red or a white wine, people always uh, swirl the wine to have that release of the bouquet to get that full aroma, but you never see someone swirling a glass of champagne. There's actually very good reason for this. And that's because the bubbles in the champagne as they rise throughout your glass of champagne and eventually go into the air, that movement of the bubbles is actually renewing all the liquid at the surface, which means it's naturally renewing the aroma molecules coming to the surface that your nose can then smell. So there's no reason to swirl champagne because as each bubble rises through your glass, it's actually dragging with it some of that surrounding liquid, some of that surrounding champagne. And this movement of the bubbles is constantly renewing that surface and bringing more flavor and aroma molecules essentially to your nose for you to enjoy. And now you have the best strategy to drink champagne according to science. So remember to cool that bottle of champagne down, choose a flute over a coupe, and when you're pouring that champagne, put your flute on an angle and gently pour in the bubbly. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.